Okay, we are good to go. So, Sheila, thank you very much for agreeing to, to promote this uh, webinar uh, for us. It's a very exciting week. I know how busy you must be uh, with this uh, special moment. I don't know if it is a, a happy moment full of success stories or a sad moment to see uh, the baby going away. But um, I think it has to be like this, right? And so um, I know that uh, Sheila works for the Royal Astronomical Society, and in particular in the field of education and outreach. And uh, you were doing, or you've done, your PhD on Cassini mission. And uh, because I know, I don't know a lot about uh, your you, yourself and your work, and you are probably the best person to share this with the, with the audience. Uh, I would like to, to ask you to spend a few minutes just telling everyone uh, your background, uh, what is it that you were doing for your PhD or that you did, and why Cassini mission uh, before we start uh, the, the presentation. Hello everybody, um, thank you for having me today. Like you said, Rosa, it is um, happy and sad about the Cassini mission ending this week, but it has to be done um, and hopefully I'll cover the reasons for that during the talk. Um, so I, when I was very young, when I was about 13, I wanted to be an astronaut, which is why I have followed the career path that I'm on at the moment. Um, I went to learn about astronauts as a child and decided that I would like to take the academic route by doing a PhD. So when I finished university, um, I did a physics degree at university and then I knew that I wanted to carry on to do a PhD. And during my PhD, I was using um, data from the Cassini spacecraft to look at the, the planet's magnetic field, the magnetosphere, and how the charged particles interact with the planet Saturn, the rings and the moons. Um, but it was also during that time that I realized that actually I enjoy being a research scientist, but I much prefer teaching other people more than um, doing the science myself. So after my PhD, I went to train as a teacher. And now I work here at the Royal Astronomical Society in London. Um, as the Education, Outreach and Diversity Officer. So the Royal Astronomical Society is a learned society. We're almost 200 years old, so it was formed in 1820, and it has been a royal institution for many, many years. And we represent astronomy and geophysics in the UK and across the, um, across the world as well. And it's, a, it's an honour to work for the RAS, but it's also an honour to be part of um, the Cassini uh, international team because it's been such an incredible mission and um, I would like to tell you about it for the next 45-50 uh, minutes. Thank you very much, that was a very inspiring introduction and uh, so I, I had the, the opportunity to take a look at uh, the, the PowerPoint that Shayla is going to share with us and I have to tell you Amazing, amazing pictures, and I, I have so many questions about so many slides. And uh, so I think uh, without further ado, I'll let you start your presentation because I know you're going to share some amazing results and curiosities with us. So yeah. if you could then share your screen first, you share, and then you put in presentation mode. And uh, let's see how it goes. And the floor is all yours. Okay, we can see your slideshow that is absolutely perfect so the floor is all yours i will interrupt you if there is any burning questions from the audience if you have questions yeah. just write on the chat and i will be sharing these questions with uh, sheila so go ahead please yeah um i have quite a lot of pictures because the mission has been so incredible i will go quite quickly through what i've got but happy to answer questions and also if there's any area that you want me to talk about in more detail i can do that as well um and so you know my background i've been involved in the cassini mission for quite a few years and so when um the spacecraft ends its life on Friday, so today's Tuesday, sorry, today's Wednesday. On Friday, Cassini will actually plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, it's been using the moon Titan as 
kind of rocket fuel. So it's used gravity assist from Titan in order to um, orbit Saturn for almost 14 years, which is almost half of one Saturn um, uh, one Saturn year. But on Friday, it will burn up in Saturn's atmosphere. And it's been such a successful mission. It's been in space for such a long time. But the reason it is burning up in the atmosphere on Friday is basically because the spacecraft has started to run out of fuel. And as it runs out of fuel, we were worried that the spacecraft would crash onto the moons, such as Enceladus and Titan. And if it crashed into the moons, that could cause an issue for planetary protection. And therefore, the best and the safest thing to do was crash Cassini into the planet's atmosphere. Um, so it will be bittersweet, but it will be quite impressive because as it does so, it is going to um, send data back to Earth and hopefully we will get some data just before, Sat uh, just before Cassini disintegrates in the atmosphere. Um, it all started over four, uh, almost 400 years ago with the astronomer um, Christian Huygens, who um, used telescopes that he made to look at Saturn. And he didn't, um, he wasn't alone in this. There were other scientists also looking at Saturn, such as Cassini. Now, um, Huygens had a friend who was called Dirk the Chimney Sweep, who also helped him to build these telescopes that he used to look at Saturn. And Huygens and Cassini were in competition because they were both looking and finding things out about Saturn. So it's quite amusing that now, Cassini and Huygens' names have been put together onto one of the most incredible spacecrafts that has ever been made by human beings. Um, planetary exploration is very similar to the um, ships that used to sail to all the different um, to, all, to all the different continents many many years ago. So you used to have to take everything with you, all your food, all your fuel. You couldn't turn around if you changed your mind. If anything went wrong, you just had to carry on going. And Cassini has been like that. We sent the spacecraft out to Saturn and it's still working over 20 years later. And I think that's incredible because I feel that if I drove my car from London to Spain, perhaps, and left it there running for 20 years and went back, it probably wouldn't be working. So it's an incredible feat of engineering that humans are able to do these kinds of um, space missions. Um, planetary science started in the very early 1960s. Um, the Russians sent a spacecraft called Venera 1 to Venus. It was the first time we really thought about planetary science and landing spacecraft on um, other planets. Venera 1 wasn't successful, but 10 years later, um, the Russian space agency sent Venera 7 to land on the surface of Venus, which was the first time human beings had ever landed anything on a planet in our solar system other than the Earth and the Moon, of course. Um, so that's where it all really started. Um, the Cassini mission has been a very long-term mission. Um, the ideas of the Cassini mission were in the early 1980s and I have met some scientists who have been part of the mission right from the conception so they have been working on the mission for almost 35 years. Um, Cassini launched in 1997, it took seven years to get to Saturn, it um, was uh, orbit insertion happened in 2004 and the mission has been extended many times until this week when the end of the mission will occur. Cassini is quite an impressive um, spacecraft. It was made um, in the 1990s, joint by NASA, the Italian Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Back then it was very, very expensive. It cost about $3 billion and it was a massive flagship mission by these three um, different space agencies. It um, is about the size of a double-decker bus, and here you can see Cassini in full with a person, well, with a few people down at the bottom for scale, and the big golden dish is the Huygens probe, and here again is the Huygens probe with some engineers um, by it. So you can see quite how large it was. And like I said, it was such a fantastic flag, flagship mission to Saturn. It was only supposed to last about four years. And it has been incredible that it's been at Saturn for such a long time because we've learned so much more 
by it being there for so long than we would have done if it had only been a four-year mission. Um, it was launched successfully, although people were worried because there were um, radioisotopes on board which formed the fuel. Because um, Saturn is so far away from the sun, the spacecraft can't use um, solar panels, so it has to use different forms of fuel for its um, electrical um, equipment. And it's been a truly international mission. There have been um, participation from different scientists across the globe. Um, by its 10 year anniversary, there was 26 nations participating. The spacecraft had traveled 2 billion miles since arrival. And there were hundreds of thousands of images taken and all kinds of incredible discoveries. And the um, spacecraft engineering team was photographed here in the 1990s, just before Cassini left um, the Earth. And then this is a recent picture of the international Cassini team. And by no means does this show all of the people that have been working on the mission. So it's not just an engineering mission, it's more about a family. And it's all these people that have been involved in this mission for many, many years. And, it, and that is why it's so kind of sad and happy when the spacecraft um, disintegrates on Friday. So Saturn is a gas giant. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. It's about, it's pr predominantly made from hydrogen and helium. It's about the width of nine Earths. Because it's a gas giant, it's less dense than water. So if you could find a very big bathtub, it would be able to float in water. And it's famous for its rings, but the Cassini mission has shown us that Saturn is not just about its rings, but the moons and the actual planet itself. Here's a picture of Saturn with the Earth to scale. And here's another one, just so you get a sense of scale in terms of the actual Cassini spacecraft and the Earth and Saturn um, as well. This is one of my favorite pictures of Saturn. It happened um, in 2013. The sun is behind Saturn, so it's an eclipse. And this shows the planet in shadow, but it illuminates the rings in their beauty. And if we zoom in and annotate the um, image towards um, what you can see here is some of the moons and the rings um, been, have been annotated. And if we zoom in even further, what you can actually see it, at the top of this picture is a ring, a part of the rings. And in the middle, the bright sort of star is the Earth. And to the left of that is the moon. So that's what the Earth and the moon look like from Saturn. Um, during the Cassini mission, because Cassini was there for such a long time, we saw lots of changes in the actual planet. The northern hemisphere, they went from winter to summer um, and like I said a year is about 29 years so um, this took from changing seasons is a slow process it takes um, half of 29 years but because of these changing seasons we were able to see lots of interesting features for example what you can see in the northern hemisphere here is a storm and these storms were quite incredible huge storms many many times the size of earth traveling up to 500 kilometers um, per hour and if you look at the same sorts of storms in the infrared you can see that there's huge amounts of energy coming from these storms and the energy releases were a mystery and some of the um, products from these energy releases are also a mystery. For example, ethylene, which is something that we didn't expect to see coming from the surface of Saturn because often those are the sorts of things that we see on um, coming from Earth but made by uh, man-made um, objects or natural objects. So there are, it was the Cassini mission has been impressive, there are still many mysteries associated with the mission. Um, at the North Pole of Saturn, looking down, there is a jet stream. It's known as the hexagon. And you can see the hexagon on the left-hand side with Earth to scale. Again, it's a huge like hurricane-type structure. At the middle, is the, it basically goes around the North Pole. And the, the vortex, the stream at the middle of the uh, North Pole, at the middle of the hexagon, is traveling very fast, um, hundreds of kilometers per hour again. And it was interesting because the hexagon was first seen by the Voyager um, spacecraft in the 1980s, but um, we, weren't, uh, we, we weren't really able to look at it properly because 
um, at the time the North Pole was in darkness. It was winter then. So um, flying over the North Pole in November 2012 and then again in September 2016, you're looking at November, you're looking at the hexagon in winter and then in summer. And these are natural color images. So you can see that um, the, the changing seasons actually changes the color of Saturn um, due to various chemical processes. And um, because of being at the, um, at, the, at the planet for so long, we actually saw equinox. So um, Saturn is tilted a similar amount to the Earth, so about 26 degrees to the sun. And that means that there are seasons. So um, when the North Pole is tilted away from the sun, it's winter. And when it's tilted towards the sun, it's the summer. But at equinox, um, the tilt is such that you see the, the rings exactly edge on. So the very thin line that you can see here is, um, is, is, the, is the Saturn's rings edge on, which I think is quite an incredible picture. And you can just about see a moon there um, balancing as if it was balancing on top of the, um, on top of the rings. And here's another picture, uh, a similar geometry. So during equinox, when the, the rings are edge on and the rings are very, very wide, but very, very thin, only tens of meters in thickness, which is quite incredible when you think how kind of um, iconic they are in terms of the, the ringed planet. So the rings have been, um, a bit of a mystery. They've got lots of different features that have been um, discussed and, and investigated over the years. One of these features are the spokes. And in this movie, you can see the dark features running from the in, inner rings to the outer rings, like the spokes on a bicycle wheel. Um, and until the Cassini mission, and the data that came from the Cassini mission, we didn't know why these spokes were occurring. And we now believe that what is happening is that charged particles are causing dust to levitate in the rings and create these features that you can see um, in, the, in the images from the Cassini mission. So that was one mystery that we think we've managed to, um, managed to work out. Another incredible image is this one. What we're looking at again is just around equinox are the ring, the rings kind of from the top down. But in the top um, section of the of the image, you can see kind of cloudy features and shadows. So what's happening here is imagine that we were on um, on a spacecraft looking at the Earth. What you might see here is an image, what you might be able to recognize here is an image of Egypt or part of Egypt, Cairo, and the pyramids, the great pyramids um, of Giza. Now, if you look at the pyramids from the top down, um, directly up, directly above them downwards, it's very difficult to see them. And that's because they, they have no shadow because we're looking directly from the top down. But if you wait until um, the geometry changes slightly, the pyramids start to have a shadow and you are able to see them. So it's very similar, um, a very similar mechanism that's happening with the rings because of the geometry of the, of, of the rings at this particular time, just before equinox, you can see these shadows being created and those are actually vertical structures in the rings. We didn't realize that the rings would have these vertical structures until Cassini took these images. And um, they're interesting because I said before that the rings are very, very, very thin, even though they're very wide. And um, these vertical structures can be hundreds of kilometers high. And we believe that these are the kinds of places that moons could form within the rings. So that's really quite interesting and quite a beautiful image as well. And um, talking about moons, the, um, the rings are kept in place by shepherd moons. So these are moons that, um, even though they're very small in relation to Saturn, the way they rotate around the planet, their gravity helps keep the rings in place. They shepherd the, um, the rings into, into place, and you can see that occurring here. Um, and these, the, in the top left where the arrow is pointing, you might be able to see a propeller feature, so kind of like a boat uh, or an aeroplane propeller. And what that this image is actually showing that within the rings, there is a very small moon. 
And it's so small that we can't see it, but what we can see is the disturbances it makes as it, um, as it, uh, as it orbits Saturn. So I think that's quite a clever, a clever picture too. Um, this one shows if you are the, the bright blob is a moon called Prometheus, but if you look at the zoom in part of the rings, you can see another bright feature. And that's actually, it was named to be a moonlet, a, a small moon called Peggy, named after a Cassini scientist, Carl Murray, after his mother-in-law, whose birthday it was when he saw this feature. And um, at first we believed it to be a moon that was being created within the rings. Um, and this was seen in 2013, but a few years later when it was, when the same area was investigated again by the Cassini, unfortunately the, the moonlet wasn't um, observed. So it's possible that it was torn apart by the, um, by the gravitational dynamics within the rings. And talking about moons, um, Cassini has been incredible in terms of learning about Saturn's moons. Before the Cassini mission, we thought that there were about 20 moons in Saturn's um, system, and now we know that there are over 50. They are really quite incredible. I'm going to fly through them now. Um, so hopefully we are able to um, have a look at some of these um, in a bit more detail. Um, I just wanted to share a few pictures with you first. This one is another eclipse picture. You can see the rings in the forefront and there, then there you can see three different moons. So there's Titan right in the back being eclipsed um, by another moon and then a smaller moon in the foreground. And I just think images like this are incredible when you think that that is a spacecraft that has been in flight for 20 years taking pictures of the Saturn system which is like a mini solar system in itself and sending those pictures back to um, to the earth for us to enjoy and here's another incredible picture with Titan and you can see um, the atmosphere of Titan and you can see the features of the moon in front I believe that's Dione um, you can see the craters of that moon in front. So again, some incredible pictures of the moons of Saturn. Um, Saturn has over 50 moons, so you can't photograph them all at one, um, all, all together. The furthest moon is 12 million kilometers from Saturn. But um, here, here and here, there's some um, semblance of a family portrait. So there are some of the moons um, in relation to the planet. Um, and again, just some incredible pictures. There's the rings there in the background with one of the moons in the front. And um, one of my favorite pictures of Titan with the rings in the forefront again. And this one I've already shown with the rings um, edge on and, and one of the smaller moons below it. This uh, is a list of all the, all the moons that have been found by Cassini uh, or have been seen by Cassini anyway. Um, some of which are don't have a real name some of which are so tiny um so there are quite a few that's going from within the rings so pan is pan prometheus etc are within the rings all the way out to past phoebe which is the furthest one of the furthest moons i show this picture because it is a family portrait of my extended family and the two people on the chairs are my grandparents and everyone in the picture has been um, is related to the grandparents and it's very similar to the Saturn um, family portrait like this kind of thing so imagine Saturn is like a grandmother or a grandfather and all the moons are related to Saturn but every single one is different just like every single person in this picture is different um, there are some very odd looking moons um, there are the some of the shepherd moons Pan and Atlas are kind of UFO shaped. The bottom picture here is a computer generated image, but this is an actual image of Atlas. And you can see that the surface is very fresh. It doesn't look like it's got many craters on it. Um, initially, when um, scientists saw these moons, we thought that um, the reason that they were these, this funny shape was because they were rotating very, very quickly. So if you imagine a ball of dough, like you were making pizza or something, and you spun it very, very quickly, it would thicken out at the equator, uh, at the equator and flatten at the North and South Pole. 
But actually these moons are these shapes because they live within the rings. And as they go around the, the ring system, they accrete matter, they, get, they gain matter at the equators. I've already talked about some of the shepherd moons um, keeping the rings in, in place. And um, here you can see one actually making waves in the, in the rings of Saturn as it goes round. And again, these incredible pictures are just stunning when you think that they are real images. Um, Cassini actually has a black and white camera, but the color images are achievable because of different filters that you can put in front of the camera, the red, green and blue, etc., and then bring them together to make the color images. And here is a small shepherd moon kicking up um, some, some material within the rings like those vertical structures that I showed you before. And again, another image here, you can see two shepherd moons within the rings um, and both are causing ripples within the rings. So these very small moons have got very, um, they're very powerful in terms of what they can do to the rings. Uh, this moon is called Prometheus. You can see it's a very strange shape. It kind of looks like a potato and it's a very old moon. It's very cratered. Um, it doesn't have any kind of um, smooth or soft surfaces. And then these two moons are called Janus and Epimetheus. Now, um, astronomers used to believe that there was only one moon in this area because um, whenever, whenever people were spotting it, they could only see what they thought was one moon with two very different faces. But actually, there are two moons and they have a very strange um, rotation. They actually share an orbit. And as far as we know, this is the only place that this happens in the solar system. So Epimetheus and Janus actually share an orbit and their gravitational effects on each other can mean that sometimes Janus is in the front, sometimes Epimetheus is in the front. And that's quite a unique um, situation. This one is um, Mimas. You can see a huge crater on the top um, right, that's called the Herschel Crater, named after William Herschel, who was the first president of the Royal Astronomical Society where I'm sat today. If we had a crater like this on the Earth, it would take out the whole of Australia. And if you look at the other side of Mimas, you can see cracks from the kind of shock waves from the um, impact. But the fact that that moon is still intact is quite impressive. And if you look at Mimas in um, infrared you can have a look at the heating patterns on the moon and um, it's interesting because it's such a strange heating pattern and we believe that it's heated in these ways due to charged particles within the Saturn system but uh, a lot of people also like it because it's shaped like a computer game like Pac-Man if you've ever played Pac-Man before and um, I also like it because it reminds me of something from science fiction. If you've ever seen uh, Star Wars, it looks a lot like the Death Star. But the first close-up image of Mimas was taken after the um, first Star Wars film. So George Lucas believes that he um, invented uh, the Death Star, even though Mimas is a, a, a moon that's probably billions of years old. Um, there are other strange moons like um, egg-shaped moons and tiny little moons only a few kilometers across. Some moons that have got um, no features on them at all. Sorry about the, the noise. Um, so this moon here, this egg-shaped moon, has no craters that we can see at all. So maybe this is a, an example of a moon that has been made quite newly, relatively newly within the rings and then has migrated outwards into the Saturn system. And then there's moons like Tethys, which look quite normal and um, kind of like uh, one of, you know, kind of like the Earth's moon. Um, but if you have a look at the different faces, the different faces are covered in different coloured um, material. And that's because of these particles within the Saturn system that exist. So as Tethys orbits around Saturn, one half gets covered in a, in a rusty coloured material and the other half gets covered in a, in a more blue colored material and the different um different energetic particles that are impacting the surface of that moon then we have dione um again beautiful pictures um when these sorts of pictures came back from dione it, people were thinking that maybe these features show that dione used to have water on and maybe those were dried up stream beds but those lines are actually cliff edges and some of them can be many 
um, tens of kilometers high. So I wouldn't want to be standing on the edge of a cliff like that, I shouldn't think. Um, and here it is again with Saturn and the rings. Um, and Dione is interesting because it has an oxygen atmosphere. And normally that would indicate um, some kind of biological life like us because of the oxygen. But the oxygen in Dione is actually being... Um, uh, is actually coming from ice on the on the surface of the moon and as the sun shines on the ice it melts and the oxygen is released to make the tenuous atmosphere um saturn also uh, cassini also spotted um it didn't spot the moon rhea but what we did make manage to see was that rhea is very much like its parent planet and has rings around it and that was interesting because um the ring system is something that is very unique to Saturn and it's um, the fact that a moon of Saturn could also have rings poses some questions and we weren't able to see the rings of Rhea using visual um, instruments but we were able to measure the rings using electron instruments so that just shows how important the collaboration of the Cassini spacecraft was um, in, in everything that uh, in, in everything that, that has been found. Um, Hyperion is another strange moon. We believe it's made from a coral-like substance, so it's very porous um, and not very heavy. But the fact that it can also be a moon of Saturn and be so different to the ones I've shown you already um, kind of give us even more questions than we started with before. And then there's Iapetus, which has a strange ridge around the equator. Um, it has a very, very highly inclined orbit. So the blue circles you can see are the orbits of some of the other moons going around Saturn. The red is the orbit of Iapetus, very highly inclined, very, very wide. So at its furthest, this would be the sort of view that Iapetus had of, um, of um, Saturn, uh, 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 looking down at Saturn from the edge of its orbit. Um, it also is an interesting moon because it has a light side and a dark side. And again, this was a mystery until the Cassini mission. And what is going on there is that Iapetus is actually visiting this moon, Phoebe, as it goes around in its highly inclined orbit. And Phoebe has a ring of its own, 12, and a, 12 million kilometers from Saturn. Um, Phoebe has a very wide extended dust ring. And as um, Iapetus does this highly inclined orbit, it touches this dust ring and causes the light and the dark faces of the moon. Now, I've um, talked about some of the moons. I've, I've got two more to talk about. Um, this one is Titan, I briefly mentioned already. Titan has been an incredible place. Um, before the Cassini mission, the Cassini-Huygens mission, we knew that Titan was interesting, but we didn't have any idea of quite how interesting it would be. And all of these are composite images um, from taken from radar instruments and others. Um, the atmosphere of Titan has um, organic molecules in, um, Carl Sagan called them folins, um, negative ions and um, energetic particles and all kinds of interesting um, precursors for for growing life like us titan is a bit like a very old primordial earth um, and has all these interesting um, chemicals in in the atmosphere and we know a lot about titan because of cassini but also because of the huygens probe um, the probe had a similar kind of journey in terms of um, conception in the 1980s and then funding um, it was obviously um, part of the launch in 1997, um, and then it was it was jettisoned from um, Cassini in December 2004, and then landed. It took three weeks to land on Titan and send data back to Cassini. But what was interesting was that um, there was some issues with the Huygens probe. And it was the engineering and the working together of the teams back on Earth that actually managed to make the Huygens landing so successful. So Cassini has tremendous speed and there's deceleration of the Huygens probe, which would have created a massive Doppler shift, which would have meant that the data transmission was not properly received. So Huygens could have landed on, on Titan successfully, but it wouldn't have been able to send the data back. 
Now the navigation team helped to find a solution and they from Earth changed the trajectory of Cassini so that it was in the post so that it was in a really good um, position so that when Huygens did land, the Doppler effect was very minimal and it was able to send back the data without a hitch. And as it landed on the surface of Titan, it was um, engineered so that um, in, in such a way, because we didn't know what the surface of Titan would have. Uh, this picture just shows some stars and then in the bottom right is um, a picture of the Huygens probe as taken from the Cassini spacecraft. And, um, as it would have landed, it would have jettisoned its heat shield and then the parachute and then the actual probe would have landed um, in 2005, making it the only object and the furthest object that human beings were able to send to land on a, um, land on a moon within our solar system. But nothing had ever gone that far and landed successfully um, back in 2005. So this was the picture that it sent back. It sent back um, quite a lot of data, some of which is still being analysed today. Um, and just incredible because there was uh, obviously a lot of media hype. Um, this newspaper got it wrong because it said the Cassini-Huygens project brought back rock samples from one of Saturn's moons, which unfortunately isn't true. And you can see um, that even the media get it wrong sometimes. Um, I like this article though because um, in the title it says creme brulee so I imagine many of you have eaten the dessert creme brulee which has got a hard crunchy topping and then it's kind of soft and squidgy underneath and the surface of Titan has often been likened to creme brulee um, and now we know that Titan has got lakes and rivers and um, all kinds of um, similarities to the earth and the water cycle and we know this because we've seen pictures like this which is a lake at the north pole of, of titan glinting reflecting the sunlight um, and we can see changes in the surface of titan as the as the rivers and the lakes um, evolve but it's not liquid water um, all these lakes are liquid methane um, and we have lots of different theories about where the methane is coming from. Is it coming from the, the um, underneath? Is it coming from the equator or the floodplains? And um, we imagine it to be kind of like Earth, but instead of all the, the rivers and the lakes of water here, we've got exactly the same, but methane. And so there we have a methane, so, so, uh, methane cycle as well. Um, is it due to cryovolcanism? Is it due to meteorites? Um, again, it, a lot of this data is still being analysed. Um, at Titan, there are also cryovolcanoes. So volcanoes on Earth are very, very hot and spew out molten rock and lava. Cryovolcanoes work in the same way, but spew out frozen material, ices, and um, and carbon dioxide and other similar things. And um, this cryovolcano this um, isn't an image it's a, a map um, is actually named after dom moons which is um a volcano in the lord of the rings um novels um we also believe that titan has a hidden ocean deep beneath the surface which would mean liquid water rock um other similar similarities to the earth so titan is such an incredible place um, this storm was seen in the southern um, hemisphere of Titan, but it wasn't there to begin with, and it 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 grew and started swirling, and um, we believe this is another seasonal effect of um, being at Saturn for so long. So Titan is very similar to a primordial Earth. There's ice, there's rock, there's a cycle, but it's methane, not water. It's still to be fully understood, but it is a very interesting place and a possible candidate for a, a future mission, um, whether that's a, a, a ship or a lander or some kind of a raft that can, can float on the methane seas, we just don't know. Another very interesting moon of Saturn is Enceladus. It's about the size of England, it's covered in ice. At the South Pole, there are cracks in the ice. Um, Cassini flew just a few tens of kilometers from the surface of Enceladus. This is another photograph from the Cassini mission. And it also flew, this isn't a real image, um, but it gives you an idea of what Cassini would have seen when it flew through, um, the, through the south pole of Enceladus, those cracks 
where there are plumes of material being ejected and Cassini was able to um, taste what was coming out of the center of Enceladus. And from these plumes, we've learned that the material is um, salty water, ammonia, um, all, kinds of, um, all kinds of other chemicals that would suggest that underneath the ice of Enceladus, there is a global salty water ocean, which would mean that Enceladus is a prime candidate for um, astrobiology and extremophiles and, and small particle, um, small microbes maybe being able to, to survive in those extreme kind of environments. Enceladus is also interesting because um, in this picture, it's similar to the one I showed at the beginning, it's an eclipse picture. Um, so Saturn is in shadow, but you can see the rings and the E ring is um, annotated. And if you zoom in on pictures like this, you can see the E ring, but within the E ring, you see Enceladus. And because Enceladus is spewing out this matter, and orbiting Saturn, it's actually populating the E-ring. The E-ring is very different to the other rings. The other rings are mostly made of solid particles of varying sizes, whereas the E-ring is made from um, ices and um, water vapor. And that's because it's being populated by Enceladus. Um, and here's another image of Enceladus and its plume, again taken by the Cassini spacecraft. And then this one's actually an amateur astronomer image, but I just think it's beautiful, so I had to show it. Um, so the end of the mission, um, the grand finale has been happening for some months with the ending on Friday. Um, because scientists knew that Cassini was going to eventually um, die in the atmosphere of Saturn, and on Friday, they've been a little bit more um, daring with some of the things that they've done um, in terms of flying Cassini very close to the surface of Saturn. Um, so in this picture, what you can see is um, Cassini flying down, looking down on Saturn, starting at the North Pole, flying down towards the gap in the rings. And you can see all kinds of structure in the atmosphere of, of, of Saturn. Um, we've also had some glorious images of the planet itself. There you can see the hexagon and the eye of the storm um, taken from the North Pole. Um, and then some very in-depth images of the rings. And these are all natural color images. So you can see different, um, different colors of the ring. So lots of beige and a few white and gray images of, of the rings. Um, Cassini was also incredible in that it went through the gap between the planet and the rings. Now, we've taken many pictures and up until now, Cassini has orbited Saturn, but nothing had ever been through the gap between the planet and the rings before. And it was quite uh, nerve wracking because we didn't know if Cassini would survive, but it did. Um, and it's since done a few ring plane crossings. And what this picture, this data is showing here is that in between the planet and the rings, there's almost no particles. It's kind of like a void of particles. And this was um, kind of expected, I suppose, if you look at pictures, but um, it hadn't been, this was brand new data only from April of this year. Um, so it's quite, quite incredible. Um, Again, this is another image. Uh, this looks like CGI, but this is Saturn with, you can see the, the sort of atmosphere of the gas giant and then the rings in the background. So if we were able to go to Saturn, these are the sorts of things that we would actually see. Um, and another very close up image of the, of the hexagon at the North Pole, and then some features on the surface of the planet. Well, I say surface, but obviously it's a gas giant. So the brighter features here that you can see are small individualized storms that rage on the um in the atmosphere of saturn so what's next um the reason that cassini is being plunged into the planet atmosphere is basically due to fuel running out and there were lots of discussions as to what we could do with cassini um some of which were for example fly back towards jupiter or fly further out um, and have a look at uranus and neptune but at the time, there was so much more that could be done um, within the Saturn system and learnt about 
the moons and the rings and the planet itself. So it was decided to keep Cassini at Saturn until the very end. Um, when Cassini first got to Saturn, we had absolutely no idea that moons like Enceladus and Titan were as important as they now know, now we know them to be. And um, because we're always talking about looking for signs of life, life like us, um, we couldn't risk Cassini crashing into Titan or Enceladus and upsetting the balance of those um, of those moons. Um, if there were any particles of, you know, sort of human, um, anything in, that had interacted with humans on the Cassini spacecraft that then crashed into Titan or Enceladus, that could have been quite awful in terms of planetary protection. So the only thing we really could have done was um, sent, sat, uh, sent Cassini into the atmosphere of, of Saturn where it will destruct safely and quite interestingly because that's never been done before. Um, but that doesn't mean that the end of the mission equals the end of um, the end of this kind of planetary exploration. Um, we've learned so much about the Cassini system, uh, so much about the Cassini mission, the actual spacecraft, about working together, about navigation, and of course so much about the Saturn system and in particular the moons. So future missions have been rewritten, textbooks about Saturn have been rewritten, and um, the things that we're looking at visiting now have changed. So now um, places that are of interest to us are, are um, I, I spoke about Enceladus, well Jupiter has a similar moon, Europa, which is covered in ice and we again believe that there is a global um, subsurface ocean. So there is talk of a mission called the Europa Clipper mission to go to Europa and have a look at that moon in more detail. Other missions that have been suggested but haven't been um, sort of evolved or funded are things like sending a drill to Enceladus and drilling through the ice and being able to sample the water and actually look for signs of life. And um, the other thing that's interesting with the Cassini mission and what we found at, at Saturn is that if these moons can be so active, so far away from the sun in such extreme conditions, then maybe exoplanet moons could also be places that could harbor life or could be places where life could exist and those would be the the very future missions that um, maybe future scientists would able would be able to work on so that is a whistle stop tour of the um the the cassini huygens um mission and the, the the lord of the ring saturn and i think we have some time for questions or if you wanted me to go back and talk more de talk in more detail about anything that i've shown you then i'm able to do that now as well so thank you very much well shayla amazing absolutely amazing i am like oh my god i didn't know all those those things i think it's that uh, we really live in a, a wonderful a wonderful solar system. It's really amazing all the discoveries that you have presented. I personally have thousands of questions, <laughs> but uh, well, we, we, we start with the questions that I have uh, uh, that I have uh, uh, collected here from the audience. They have been uh, writing here. Uh, just want to say that one of the participants is saying that was an amazing talk, very well explained and beautiful picture. Thank you for all the details. And I think uh, I, I copy that. Okay, so uh, the first question that we have here is from the, the, the school that is watching us, a school from Mozambique is live. We were to have a few schools in Europe as well, but uh, classes are starting today. So uh, it was hard oh, okay. for most of them to participate. So the question is, the team, I think you answered that already, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more, is saying the team involved uh, in Cassini Organ will do another mission on another planet out of the solar system? Um, well, I guess at the moment the technology is the problem for actually sending spacecraft outside of the solar system. Um, like I said, um, Cassini took seven years to get to Saturn and it's been successful because it's been there for so long. Um, there's currently a mission going around Jupiter called the Juno mission and there are other European missions um, aiming to go to Jupiter 
and um, and Europa, like I mentioned, within our solar system, we haven't visited everything in depth. So there's still Uranus, Neptune. Now, obviously, we have data from New Horizons and Pluto. But um, in terms of planetary exploration, I think sending spacecraft, the next steps would be Uranus and Neptune. And for extra solar planets, so pla um, solar systems outside of our own, most of this will still be done in the same fashion that we have been doing it up until now. So using um, transit methods and um, spectroscopy, spectroscopy and other similar methods to look at planets outside of our solar system. But we aren't able to send spacecraft to planets outside of our solar system at this time. How much, how much time would we need? I mean, maybe they don't know how far is the next, uh, the next planetary system. So how much time and uh, planning and money do you think it would cost to send a, a mission to another planet outside the solar system? Um, I think in terms of uh, building it and the cost and things, it's not so bad. It would be similar to the Cassini mission. But sending, I think... I don't know exactly where the nearest extra solar system is, but it would be like maybe light years away. So unless we were traveling at the speed of light, it would take hundreds of years to get there, which we don't have that technology yet, unfortunately. So it would not be in our lifetime and we don't know how to do it yet. Okay, that's very good and important information. Okay, the next question we have is from Thomas asking, is the rings of Saturn the same as the rings on other outer planets? Um, we don't actually know. Um, it's, other planets do have rings, for example, Uranus. Um, we haven't had such an in-depth study of other rings because we haven't, we've only flown by Uranus, we haven't orbited it or anything. Um, and the Saturn system seems to be quite not unique because there are other rings but um it's such a huge and glorious place with the rings and the moons that um we kind of think that it's a a, a marker for how things could be um we imagine that the other rings around other planets would be similar but we don't know like for example i talked about the e-ring that was being populated by enceladus um we have no evidence of that happening at uranus or or any other any other planets so um it's that sort of thing still remains a mystery okay it's, it's kind of amazing you know it's just so close here and so much to learn yet yeah okay so homoalda uh, commented that uh, it was a very interesting uh, comparison with the pyramids and there is a question about uh, if it is possible to evaluate how many undiscovered moons saturn has um I think it depends on what we believe about how the moons are being created. If there are moons that are being created within the rings, then perhaps there have been many since um, Cassini has been orbiting Saturn. Um, the big moons have certainly been observed, um, but it's these little moons that might be being created, maybe even now, um, that are still yet to be discovered. Okay. Uh, another question from Jean Souza is, what's the next major mission to a solar system object from, coming from Europe? Um, so there are a few. There's the ExoMars rover, which will be hopefully launching in 2020 to Mars. Um, that's a rover. Um, and obviously there have been other rovers to Mars, for example, the Curiosity rover by NASA. But it's a European mission and it will hopefully include a drill. So we will be able to drill into the surface of Mars and actually analyze the Martian soil. There's also the JUICE mission, which is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission, which is another European orbiter to um, look at Jupiter, but particularly look at the four large moons of Jupiter. Um, I'm not sure how far along that, that is in terms of when it's going to be built and launched, but that's another important European mission. And Europe has um, a lot of involvement in other missions, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope. And um, most, most big missions nowadays tend to be collaborations between NASA and, and ESA and, and other space agencies. Okay, that's all very interesting. 
So that means that uh, we might finally discover that uh, there's something down there on Mars. Let's hope that they yeah. will find something there. Yeah. Okay, Romualdo also asked, why Saturn has so large rings? Um, Saturn's the second largest planet in the solar system, so its gravity is very strong. And its gravity tends to be localized around the equator. So um, it depends on what we believe in the formation of the rings. But if there was a massive... Um, uh, if there was a massive object that was smashed to pieces at the beginning of the formation of Saturn to form the rings, then the gravity of Saturn would have kept the, those pieces in, in line to make the rings. Um, and then we have the other, the other factors such as the moons, the shepherd moons and um, Enceladus to, to keep the rings in place. So it's mostly down to gravity, that one. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, Jupiter is larger than Saturn and it doesn't have such uh, uh, large rings. Yeah, so we think, well, we, we don't know, but when the solar system was formed, whatever it was that gave the matter, gave the particles to make the rings at Saturn, the same wouldn't have happened at Jupiter. So mm -hmm. if it was like a moon or something that got ripped apart, that didn't happen at Jupiter, which is why it doesn't have those rings. Okay. Another question is from Julie, uh, and is, she's asking, in your opinion, what is the number one discovery from Cassini mission or top three if picking one is too hard? Um, I'm, I've always loved Enceladus. That's always been my favorite moon. And it's, I like it because it's so small. Um, if Enceladus was the size of your thumbnail, um, Saturn would be about the size of a bus. So you can see how small Enceladus is in relation to its parent planet. But it has such a profound effect on Saturn. It's making the ring, the E-ring. But not only that, is that it's so far away from the sun, but it's such an active moon. It's spewing out this matter. We believe it's got this ocean underneath. Um, and we've seen microbes called extremophiles in the north and south pole of the Earth that can... Um, that can survive extreme conditions, similar to the conditions we believe are on Enceladus. So I believe that if we are going to find life in our solar system, it won't be necessarily on Mars, it might be on Europa or Enceladus. So Enceladus is definitely my favorite um, discovery from the Cassini mission. Okay, wow, interesting, <laughs> very interesting. And uh, there's one participant asking, do all rings orbit Saturn with the same angular velocity? What about uh, the, the shepherd moons? Yeah, everything rotates together. Um, it's all to do with angular momentum and velocity. The shepherd moons do change slightly um, because I was saying about how their gravity just changes things ever, ever so slightly. But in general, everything all rotates around the same, same sorts of speeds. Okay, and then there's another question, which is, is expected that the Saturn rings discoveries will apply to other planet rings? I think yes. Um, over, overall, yes, it would do. Um, there are not so many reasons why the rings would be different, unless um, there were slightly different factors. I've mentioned Enceladus already many times. Um, if another moon didn't have, if another planet didn't have a moon like Enceladus that was populating a ring, then that type of ring wouldn't occur. But the normal rings, the, the solid particle rings, would be very similar uh, at other planets. Okay, uh, then we have another one asking, I think you, you already mentioned this, but maybe a strict answer. Are there any plans from spacecraft that will succeed Cassini? Um, yeah, so we, we talked about the Europa Clipper mission. Um, that's a NASA mission to Europa, hopefully, um, but there's no dates or anything on that. Um, in terms of the big planetary missions, um, the European mission to Jupiter Juice, there's also already NASA's Juno mission going around Jupiter. Um, and hopefully in the future, there will be big missions similar to Cassini, but looking at Uranus and Neptune, because we really don't know that much. Um, about them at the moment. Okay, one more question from José Saraiva asking, any ideas about the source of heat for the Encelados jets? Why are they concentrated on that particular area? 
Um, we think that there might have been cracks in the ice in the other in other areas that have maybe closed up um, for the time being. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the heat is coming from friction. Um, there's also um, chemicals in the ocean that would uh, act kind of like an antifreeze. So there's ammonia, um, sulfur, uh, and other um, chemicals like that that would cause the ice to, to melt. Um, and the the plumes are like volcanoes. So the the mechanisms are very similar to volcanoes. But instead of spewing out hot lava, it's spewing out these these cold, um, you know, these frozen particles instead. Okay, and I think we don't have any more questions from the audience. I have one, uh, which is you showed that picture of a Titan eclipse, an annual eclipse. It was like, wow, this is so amazing. Yeah. Was that a coincidence? What was a planned one? Um, I I don't know. I think it was probably a coincidence. Um, I mean, in terms of knowing where the moons and, and Saturn and Cassini are, the navigation of this whole mission has been incredible. Um, the, the way, the geometry of the whole mission and knowing exactly where everything is, um, people do know it down to very, very um, specific locations. And we need to be able to do that to, to communicate with Cassini and send data back. So they would have known where the where the moons were, but I think the picture probably was just um, being at the right place at the right time. Okay. Well, what can I say? This was absolutely amazing. I have another comment here from Julie saying, thank you, Sheila, for the great talk and thank you, Rosa, for organizing it. This was very useful overview from someone directly involved in the mission. Yeah, and someone asking if it is recorded. Yes, it is recorded and we will make it uh, available uh, and we will announce in our social media when this is available. And I think I, I want to, to end uh, thanking you so much uh, for being available and for providing us with a such nice overview of everything that was discovered. I, I have to say that uh, I didn't know uh, many of the, the, the things that you shared. It's really, it was mind boggling. And um, I take the opportunity, well, I see that you like science fiction and fantasy. I think many scientists uh, share that. And uh, I think for the audience and those students watching this, science is the key you know uh, just uh, science fiction so very often transforms itself into reality so yeah. if you really want to have something exciting in your life turn your brain to science Sheila very thank you very 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 much and, make and sure uh, watch the well you with the data from the end of the Cassini mission won't come maybe till Saturday or Sunday but do keep an eye out because that's going to be quite special Oh, sure. I mean, we have an event here in Portugal for that. And uh, also, we will certainly make uh, all the imagery and information available in our social media. You can find it in Europlanet uh, social media. You will be able to find it in the Galileo Teacher Training Program social media. So we will make sure that uh, the information is there for all of you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I hope to see you somewhere soon. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Bye everyone and thanks for everything. Thank you. And th